Hello everyone, good morning. Uh, welcome to Bible study today. Uh, we are going to be looking in the third chapter of Ecclesiastes today. So if you have your Bible uh, nearby, I hope you'll go ahead and uh, grab that and um, be ready. Uh, this is easily the best known section of Ecclesiastes. And we're going to deal with just these 15 verses that fall in this, this section um, that is best known and uh, has been made into songs and all sorts of things, right? Ah, uh, oh, thanks, Ellen. That's beautiful. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was thinking this morning, um, I think I now know more people who've been vaccinated than I know people who've had COVID. And I know quite a few people who've had COVID. Uh, but we're making some real progress uh, around here in vaccination, uh, and that's very encouraging uh, in, indeed. All right, let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, and let's read the passage together, and then uh, we'll begin to dig into it. Uh, I'll just, I'm reading from the NRSV. You may know this from the King James. Uh, you may know it from some other translation. Uh, we're going to talk about some nuances in some of these words in just a moment. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Some translations say beautiful in its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. We're going to stop there at the end of verse 15. Uh, and that's the, uh, the, the unit we're going to deal with today. It, th this is one of those uh, passages that uh, not only is so well-worn and so well-known that you can easily just let it flow through your brain, it, it's an odd passage in that it's a common piece of scripture to be used both at weddings and funerals. Uh, and there's not many <laughs> passages of scripture uh, we can say that about uh, I guess maybe 1 Corinthians 13, uh, the 23rd Psalm, uh, perhaps, but that would be a bit odd to use at a wedding. Uh, but I have heard uh, this passage from Ecclesiastes used to celebrate uh, a wedding and to mark a, uh, a death at a memorial service or a funeral. Um, there's a lot of little detail I want to get into here, but I'm going to give away the ending at the beginning today with the lesson. Uh, so if, if you get tired of hearing me rattle, uh, after this next little section, you're going to have the nut of the whole thing. Uh, 
if this lesson had a title, and most of these lessons that I'm doing don't really have a title, it would be how to know what time it is. How to know what time it is. And I, I, I've got some overall comments about the, the, the text that I want to make as we begin digging into it. I tried to come up with three points, but I could only come up with two. But I've got a lot of subpoints uh, to the two points, so maybe it's really more than two. Uh, in thinking about this question, how to know what time it is, which I think is the theme of this beginning part of Ecclesiastes chapter three, it's, it's about understanding the time. Uh, and by the way, uh, the word time here in Ecclesiastes is not the, it, 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 it's not the, uh, in Greek, there's, of course, this is obviously Hebrew, uh, but there's a connection. It, it's not the kind of pregnant time that you may have heard a sermon or something, a study about the word kairos. Uh, it, 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 it's not that. This is just a standard, this is a standard word for time uh, that means an appointed time. Uh, it, it, it's not necessarily a special time. It's just that to everything, verse one says, there, and both this word season and the word time in verse one, uh, they're different words in Hebrew, but they mean essentially the same thing. Uh, an appointed time to everything. There is uh, an appointed time or, or an appropriate time. Uh, and this is, even in Hebrew, this is one of the, uh, this is like us saying uh, uh, we, we, we have a purpose and a mission, right? Well, we're saying the same thing by that. They're, they're slightly different words, but they're heading in the same direction. Uh, and even the word that's translated in the NRSV as for everything is a, is a Hebrew word that means for every purpose. All things have a time and a reason and an appointed time with this. Uh, and yeah, no, Carter, you're right. There's all sorts of, uh, uh, I think that's actually Chicago, isn't it? Uh, does anyone really know what time it is? Um, all sorts of uh, ways this, this uh, Ecclesiastes passage has been set to song. And it's hard to uh, not think in those musical terms, really. Okay, my two big points about Ecclesiastes chapter three. The first is that we must acknowledge that there are seasons of life. We must acknowledge that there are seasons of life. Uh, and these seasons are not all the same. This passage from Ecclesiastes uh, teaches us that there are different moments and movements of life that all add up to make the whole, uh, and they happen. Uh, the, the message of time in this uh, third chapter of Ecclesiastes is not talking about special times. It's not talking about extraordinary time. It is talking about average time. And all of these experiences, uh, there are 28, there's 14 pairs in here. Uh, 14 duos like uh, to, born and to, to be born and to die is one. Uh, so there's 28 life experiences. And an interesting thing about them is that except for verse three, a time to be born and a time to die, which we have no control over, uh, all the other things on the list are things that we do have some control over. Uh, our actions, our choices uh, contribute to these things. Now, there's a whole other thread we'll talk about in a moment about how you could read Ecclesiastes 3 as um, a bit of predestination, uh, predeterminism, but I won't get ahead of myself on that. So we acknowledge that there are seasons of life and they're not all the same. The, the second subpoint of that is that we must be adaptive to those seasons of life. Uh, Ecclesiastes teaches us that we've, we've got to acknowledge and find our way through 
these different seasons of life. And my goodness, uh, certainly COVID has taught us a lesson in this, as we've all had to adapt in so many ways to a particular season of life that we could not have imagined being. And yet at the same time, understanding that there are seasons of life helps us cope when we are struggling through those seasons of life. To know that this is a season, to know that uh, things change and that what we're experiencing in this moment is not what we will always experience as well. And in that, sometimes we need to know that we're doing the best we can in the moment we're living. Uh, I have a friend uh, who is caring for two elderly parents uh, with different uh, illnesses, one with severe dementia, one with Parkinson's, and things just are snowballing by the week. Uh, and he's essentially the only caregiver that they have um, in this journey. And he just, he can't believe that he's doing the right thing because he's always second guessing himself that he ought to be doing something. And many of you who have been caregivers for others in different times of life, uh, or maybe are even now, know very well this feeling. Like, am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right decision? Am I, am, am I being loving? Am I being caring? And I, what I've said to this friend over and over and over, the, over again, probably the, the only gift I can give him is to say, you are doing the best you can in the circumstances that you've been given right now. And sometimes in these seasons of life, we need someone alongside us to say, you are doing the best you can. And that's all we can expect in that moment because none of us can be the kind of superhero that we want to be. So the first big point I would make is that we have to acknowledge that there are seasons of life. The second point is that there is an important role of discernment to be had, the importance of discernment. To know what time it is uh, and to understand that all, not all times are the same and not all times require us to respond uh, in the same way. And Ellen, your comment is exactly on point with that. Uh, sometimes you can't go over it, under it, or around it, and you have to go through it. And here's the discernment. How do you do that? First point is being open to change. Because if we are resistant to the seasons of life, we will always struggle with the seasons of life. A second point to that is that we must listen to others who help us make sense of the times in which we live. It is rare that we can figure this all out by ourselves. And so we often need the help of friends, families, counselors, uh, wise people around us to help us discern the time in which we're living. Because this is not like reading a novel where you go through and there's a chapter title and you know that you flip from one chapter to the next and has a title and you know what it is. Life does not work that way because it's typically only when we're in a new season of life that we understand suddenly we're in a new season of life and we may not fully comprehend it until we have left that chapter and moved on to the next one. And so discernment becomes very important in this. A third point I would make about discernment is that it's important to shut out voices that reinforce our past or our fears. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, when we are navigating a new season of life or a difficult season of life, it is very comforting for us to listen to people uh, who want us, who want to tell us things are the way we want them to be, right? It is very easy. And we can see this play out in so many ways. The human nature 
wants to be comfortable. And there are always people around us, whether for their gain or for just evil, uh, will gladly tell us what we want to hear and reinforce uh, things that keep us from moving forward into the moment in which we find ourselves now. And that is dangerous. Uh, the fourth point I want to make about discernment is that it's important not to get trapped in looking for, I'm going to use air quotes here, signs of the times. Uh, now, you, the kind of church I grew up in, we were always looking for signs of the times for the end times, right? Uh, but there's also this, this whole idea uh, that we're, we're trying to interpret and make sense of, you know, uh, predictions and prophecies and all these things, which can blind us to understanding the reality of where we are now. If we're always anticipating something we think is going to happen, we're only going to be looking for that thing that we think is going to happen. And we're going to miss the time or the season in which we live in this moment. We're going to miss the possibilities of things that come our way that we could not have envisioned. When you're only looking for signs of the times, you're only looking for the things that you can imagine. But so much of life's good comes in ways that we cannot imagine. So does so much of life's bad. Uh, both It works both ways with this. But the point is, as long as we're only looking for certain things, that's all we're gonna see. But discernment calls us to understand and anticipate seasons of life that we cannot envision. And that's for good as well as for bad. Uh, and I'm looking at your comment, Christy. Yeah, your testimony is absolutely right on that, Christy, and really to the point. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, I want to dig in just a little more into some of the specifics of uh, th this passage as we go through. Um, I explained in verse 1 about the, the, the word everything and season and time. Um, then we get to the, the set of these uh, pairs. Uh, again, it's, it's a very formulaic thing. Um, in, in fact, hearing this passage read aloud gets a little boring. It's much better set to song. Uh, than, than read aloud, I think. A time to be born and a time to die. Uh, this is not, the, the word born here is not just about passively being born, but it also implies uh, giving birth. There is a time for us to create. There's a time for us to give birth to things. And there's a time for us to set aside things as well. Uh, so while this is on its face about physically being born and physically dying, it also is about giving birth to new things and setting aside things. That there is in the cycle of life uh, creativity that produces and the wisdom that says, I need to lay this aside now. This is, this is done. Uh, it's interesting uh, on the idea of being born and of dying uh, th that it is only by acknowledging the reality of our own death that we live most fully. If death were not a looming threat, we wouldn't appreciate and enjoy and use life as well as we do because we would certainly take it for granted. And uh, we can hear the testimony of those who have skirted very close to death and uh, come back, uh, not just near-death experiences, but those who, whose lives have been endangered and have a new appreciation for living life with, with zeal and making use of the time that they have. That's an illustration of that. The next pair is a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. Uh, this, is just, <laughs> this is just what it says. Uh, there, there are times in which we do new things that sprout and grow, and there are times we have to say, uh, that's not growing anymore. I'm not going to put my energy in that anymore. And, and yet how many of us spend 
fruitless hours uh, trying to water and till and uh, encourage parts of our lives that are not going to produce again. Uh, verse 3, uh, uh, one of the most difficult lines in here, a time to kill and a time to heal. It's an interesting pairing here, right? A time to kill. And this, this word in Hebrew actually means to slay. Uh, it also can commonly mean to destroy or ruin. And then there's also a time to heal. We, we most often think of this time to kill as a, being about murder, uh, and sometimes this is used as a justification for war. Uh, and that's not a completely out of the realm of reality with this passage. Uh, some see this, uh, you know, a, a, a time to wage war and a time to uh, bring about peace through diplomacy. Uh, that some, you know, you can have a whole thing off of that. Um, I want to help you think about it in yet another way as well. And that is um, sometimes we enter a season in which we need to kill off evil ideologies and ideas. Sometimes we are called as believers to speak truth to things that are wrong in the world. Sometimes we can bring healing and sometimes we can seek peacemaking. But I read this passage as saying there are seasons and times of life in which we can't naively say, well, let's just all get along because we must take a stand for things that are wrong and things that are destructive to God's intent in the world. That's another form of killing. Uh, it's not murder but it's standing for the truth and killing off bad uh, ideologies uh, in here. A, a time to break down and a time to build up. Same idea here, really. Uh, these, these sort of go together. Uh, that there are times when we have to deconstruct and there are times we have to construct within this. Uh, a, a time to weep and a time to laugh. And if there's any phrase in here that gets to the human experience most clearly, it would be this, because we know that there are times uh, when we laugh and there are times when we weep. And if we only have one or the other and not both, there's something wrong, right? We're, we're, we're going to have an emotional uh, problem if we're not both laughing and weeping. If you, if you can only weep ever, and not find some humor in something, uh, you probably need some help dealing with that. And at the same time, if you can only laugh and never can weep, uh, you're denying the reality that you live in uh, and, and need that. Uh, again, the, the pair here goes together, a, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Uh, so one is, um, the, the, the grieving that is paralleled by dancing representing uh, joy, right? Uh, and I, I, I think um, there's a comment I wanted to make about that. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll come back to that in a moment, okay? A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. Now, I know this is an odd one. Um, several ways of looking at this. Uh, one of those is, uh, this is a sexual euphemism. Uh, to gather stones and to throw away stones. Uh, <laughs> so, I'll just leave you with that. Uh, which goes along with a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. You can sort of see how those work together as well. Uh, verse six, a time to seek and a time to lose. What is this saying? Uh, it's acknowledging that sometimes we're on a quest to find the things we're after. Um, 
But there are also times in which we have to acknowledge that we've lost those things and uh, that a quest to restore them is futile, right? Um, this is a, a, an interesting reality of life to have the wisdom and the discernment to know when to keep seeking and when to acknowledge a loss. Uh, a time to keep and a time to throw away. Uh, th this whole idea of, of keeping and throwing away can also be about um, keeping watch. Uh, there's a time to keep, there's a time to keep watch in here, whereas throwing away is uh, meaning to perish or... Uh... <laughs> I just saw your comments. <laughs> I encourage you to Google that. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is one of those uh, ancient, um, it's a cultural reference. Uh, you know, it, it, it's the equivalent of, you know, when I was growing up, uh, if a woman was having a, a hysterectomy, uh, it was in the hospital, what we were always told was she was having female surgery. Uh, and that, that's, that's the phrase I learned as a kid, right? Because you couldn't say the word. Uh, and that's sort of what's going on here. Uh, it's about bringing together and pulling apart. Uh, it's about intimacy and not intimacy. Uh, stones together, stones apart is a way of thinking about that. Uh, hope that helps. <laughs> Oh, uh, geez. Um, a time to keep and a time to throw away also could be a lesson to us in generosity. And several commentators pull this out to say that certainly there's a time to keep the resources we have, but there's also a time to give away and share the resources that we have. Uh, and so they find in this passage a lesson in our generosity. To throw away is not always just to put in the trash, but it is to, to give away sometimes as well uh, so that we help someone else in the process, that we don't just hoard what we have. So you can think about this in very simple terms. When you take used clothing or household goods to goodwill, uh, you are, in a sense, throwing them away from you. You are casting them off, but you're not throwing them in the trash you're providing someone else the means to use those things, right? And for goodwill to make some money uh, along the way to help people. Uh, and the same thing is true with all of our assets and resources that uh, we're not intended to hoard them and keep them to ourselves. There is a time to gather and to earn, and there's a time to give and to be generous as well. Verse seven, a time to tear and a time to sow. So one of the ways to think about this is in the context of uh, the Old Testament practice of you know, rending your clothes uh, when, you're, when you're grieving. And, and, and uh, we see this reference over and over again. There's a time to sit in despair and to rip things apart, but it also indicates that after that time of grieving, it's appropriate to sew things back together again. It's not that you stay always torn apart, but that that which we grieve, we also find a way to sew back together again. It's, um, it takes both things within there. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. It's interesting that this is paired with the time to tear and a time to sew uh, one of the ideas here is that there are times when it's best to keep your mouth shut. Uh, and Christy has referenced for us before, uh, particularly when you're walking through grief, people can be very unhelpful and tell you all sorts of things that you don't need or want to hear. They think they're being helpful, but they'd be better off if they just didn't say a darn thing, right? Uh, and we all fall in that uh that experience sometimes where we would be better off if we said nothing. Um, sometimes 
as we learn from the book of Job, silence is appropriate in the presence of bereavement. Sometimes we need to keep quiet. Sometimes we need to speak. But here we are back to this idea of discernment, being able to figure out what is the right time to speak and what is the right time to keep silence. Both of those are appropriate in their time, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks for your confession, Carla. <laughs> A lot of us suffer from that um, because we are quick to want to help other people with our wisdom. But sometimes our wisdom is not helpful at all. And here we are to the idea of discernment, understanding the time. What time is it? Is it the time for me to speak or is it the time for me not to speak? Okay, I'm reading your comment. Um, okay, Linda, I'll, yeah, let, let's take that one uh, off to the side uh, because that's a complicated answer. Uh, but it's a fair question, nonetheless. Um, verse eight, a time to love and a time to hate. Now, what? why would there be a time to hate, <laughs> right? Uh, that seems against everything we believe in that we should never hate. Uh, well, certainly we know that we can hate what is evil. Uh, and certainly we know that uh, there, are, there are things we can't love everything uh, because if you love everything, you love nothing. Uh, every, everything's the same. And so there has to be a dichotomy here. It, this is not to uh, encourage hate speech. This is not to encourage uh, being evil. But we can also hate the things that are destructive. Uh, we can hate things that tear down rather than build up. Uh, and you're right, Linda, you can hate things without hating people. Uh, very hard uh, sometimes. I don't always succeed at that uh, at all. A time for war and a time for peace. Um, so this goes back to our earlier comment about a time to kill and a time to heal. Um, the reality of our life is that there is a time when we have to do battle over some things and that there also is a time for peace. But I want you to look at the total construct of this passage because the order matters as well. If you go back to verse two, where the, the 14 pairs begin, it begins with a time to be born and a time to die. So you have the perceived positive followed by the perceived negative. But here at the end, the thing is flipped. The pair is inverted so that we have a time for war followed by a time for peace. And this is significant because uh, in, in, the, in literary terms, what the author is doing here is beginning with the positive of being born and ending with the positive of peace. And the word peace here sort of becomes the punchline to the whole thing. It's the last word in this. The last word is not war. The last word is peace. And in this construct, we see a carefully thought out um, mechanism for understanding life. Now, it's possible that... Uh, it's possible that the Coleth, uh, the author of uh, Ecclesiastes, took this, these eight verses wholesale from some existing poem or song and brought them in. We don't know, but the, the structure is different than the rest of the book. Uh, still beautiful, but it appears to be a whole unit that could have come from somewhere else. Uh, so just be aware of that. Um, also. Um, now, on to these few verses that follow. What gain have the workers from their toil? I've seen the business that God has given everyone to be busy with. 
He has made everything suitable, in our, uh, NRSV says, uh, for his time. The, the NIV, for example, in verse 11 says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Everything beautiful in its time. Um, first, we see that the business that God has given us as human beings um, can be unhappy, uh, can be even evil. But now in verse 10, we get a context. God has made everything suitable or beautiful for its time. This is a word of uh, appropriateness. Now, as we read on in this section, we're challenged to think about how much of this is predestined for us and how much of this is free will for us. Because you could read on uh, in this passage, uh, for example, uh, nothing can be added to it, nothing can be subtracted to it. You could find in that uh, some predeterminism for sure. Uh, or that which is already has been, and that which is to be already is, and God seeks out what has gone by. That could be uh, a bit of predestination uh, as, as well. What I want to encourage you to think about in this is not so much that God has predestined things, because I, I think we see in this and the rest of Scripture a teaching of free will that overrides any notion of that. But in this, we may see um, instead uh, a notion of God's knowledge. We, we can talk about God's foreknowledge without talking about God's predetermination of things. Uh, when we read in verse 15, that which is already has been and that which is to be already is, uh, that could be an indication of God's all-knowing nature, uh, omniscience, uh, without God directing the play uh, as if pulling strings on marionettes. There is a way to, to think about that. Um, let me back up to verse 11. God has made everything suitable or beautiful for its time. And the author goes on to say that God has put a sense of past and future into our minds, yet we can't figure out what God is doing from beginning to end. There's a way to think about this that ties back to the book of Genesis. What is it that Adam and Eve were after in the garden? They were after the, the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, they were after understanding uh, the way the story goes. And here again, our experience of life is that we can never quite figure everything out. And Anyone who says they've figured everything out, you ought to be suspect of, right? Uh, and this is, this is the glass darkly that we see through, as the Apostle Paul says. Uh, because if we understood everything fully, we would be like God. And that is not possible for us in this realm. And so that's part of what the author is acknowledging here, is that even though we may have a sense of time, we humans are prone to forget time and we're prone to repeat our mistakes. We're prone not to learn from history along the way. We're prone not to uh, be in tune with the things that might help us navigate uh, periods and times of life. Verse 12, uh, the author says, I know there is nothing better than for them to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. And it's God's gift for us to eat and drink and take pleasure in their toil. So if you think the book of Ecclesiastes is all gloom and doom, here's an example in how it's not. Because the author says that our purpose, and we had the same thing in last week's verses in chapter two, uh, calling us to find pleasure in the moments of life, um, that we experienced. And we talked last week about the importance of living in the present. Uh, to, and I think that was a good setup for le this lesson. Whatever the time or season of life we find ourselves in, we've got to live in that season. And we've got to be present in that moment uh, and not act as though we are living in some other season of life. 
that's a, that's a huge theme throughout literature uh, and, and religion as well. Uh, those who desperately cling to a time that they're not currently living in. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting way off on that uh, as well. Uh, God's commandment to us is to live in joy. Uh, and so this is an ethical teaching for us as, as well. Um, I'm looking for the, any other point that I've forgotten to make out of this. Um, yeah. Mm. Again, there is a, there's a time there's a season uh, for everything under the sun, this says. And I want to recap uh, the two points I began the lesson with. The importance of acknowledging that there are seasons of life and the importance of using discernment to walk through those seasons of life as well. Let me pause and see what other um, questions or comments you may have. And... Uh, Thank you for all the musical references. Uh, certainly, uh, Ecclesiastes 3 has inspired a good bit of music. Uh, what comments, questions would you add that, uh, or if there's anything I haven't addressed that you put through here, please ping me again. Uh, I've tried to keep up with what you're saying along the way. Yeah. Questions, comments, anyone? <laughs> yeah. A time to remember and a time to forget, um, whether we want to or not sometimes, right? Yes. You know, uh, it's a trite saying, this too shall pass. Um, that's oversimplification, I think, uh, because one of the challenges of the seasons of life is we don't know how long they last because we don't have the overarching view. And um, for any of, any of you who have been through seasons of disability or grief or um, maybe unemployment or family distress or um, it, mental distress, uh, physical challenges, you know that one of the hardest things about that is not knowing how long that period of life will last. Someone can say to you, this will pass. And while that may be true, uh, not knowing how long that will be and how it will be afterward uh, is also very disorienting to us. And it's hard to imagine something new. Uh, uh, Linda, I, I'll have a private conversation with you about the Equality Act if you'd like. Uh, that, I, I don't want to get into that on this lesson uh, because it really is an entirely different subject. Um, if, if that's okay, I'll be, I'll be glad to have a conversation with you about that. All right. Any other comments? Thank you for your participation today. And as we conclude, uh, I just encourage you to pay attention to the updates uh, on prayer concerns coming from Charlene. A uh, lot going on with our folks. And uh, some of you uh, may be signed up to go to church in the lot tonight. Um, hope that uh, you will uh, take advantage of that if you're able to. Uh, pay attention to all the other things that are uh, coming around and going on during this season. Um, and I am looking forward to someday, maybe sooner rather than later, seeing you all again as we move into a, a, a better phase, hopefully, a different season of our coronavirus experience. Let's pray together. Lord, hear our prayers uh, with gratitude for the seasons that you have given us. Help us to be discerning and grant us wisdom to act well as we walk through the seasons of life that come our way. We pray today for each one in our class who's facing medical and personal challenges, that you continue to lift them up and heal them, bring hope to them, we pray. And grant each of us your peace for this week ahead. We pray through Jesus Christ, amen.
goodbye, y'all.